On this week's episode of Top of the List, we're going to be discussing The Mandalorian Season 2. We're catching up on our reviews. We're talking chapters 12 and 13. Um, you know, first, we need to do a little housekeeping. So, RB, can you kind of fill people in why we didn't do a review last week? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, happy belated Thanksgiving to all of you out there and uh, hope you're feeling well rested after your big meals last night. Um, and for those of you who maybe didn't get as much rest like us and watched uh, Mandalorian Chapter 13, we're excited to talk, that, talk about that with you. But first, uh, like Dom said, why we didn't uh, film last week, uh, you know, uh, we had a good time. We had uh, Dom coming up to visit uh, myself and Caitlin up in the Bay Area. Um, we're looking to to move, put a or getting ready to sign a lease for a new apartment. So this will be one of our last top of the list episodes that you'll see us in uh, separate places. So get ready for some more uh, fun content and a little more interaction between Dom and me as uh, we uh, venture now into uh, being roommates and having a good time yeah. with this show. But uh, you know, jumping now back into the Mandalorian, uh, as we mentioned, chapters twelve and thirteen. Chapter 12, of course, a really exciting episode. A lot of uh, familiar faces from season one returning here in season two. Solid episode. I'm going to give it an eight and a half out of 10. And then jumping into last night's episode, of course, The Jedi, what we've been waiting for, a live action Ahsoka Tano on screen. Brilliant, brilliant episode. Possibly the greatest episode ever made in this series. 10 out of 10, without a doubt. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so... I'll give my score. We're talking chapter 12 first right now. So what was your score? I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. Eight and a half out of 10. Eight and a half for last week's episode, which, uh, you know, Ryan and I have come to kind of call the, you know, quote unquote side missions, you know, always something side mission like before the big episode, which was this week's episode, uh, you know, came out Thanksgiving at midnight. Um, but yeah, so, you know, chapter 12, uh, you know, baby Yoda and, Mandalorian, Return to Navarro. Um, this was, you know, as far as the side missions go, you know, we talked about uh, earlier in the season, the one where there's the frog lady and he's trying to take the eggs, save the eggs, and there's the ice spiders. That was, you know, an okay side mission as far as, I, th I think, what did we give that one, Ryan? A, a six, I think, is what we gave it? I, I think I gave it a seven. I think you gave it a six and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, you know, a good, def definitely, you know, above average, but it wasn't as good as this side mission that they took place on Navarro. We got to see a lot of Mando fighting some Empire soldiers and, you know, stormtroopers, and we got to see uh, Carl Weathers' character return, along as Gina Carano um, also return, and we get to see what's happening on Navarro after the season one finale. Wow, you, hold up, hold up. You did miss one major and probably my favorite thing about episode 12 or chapter 12. The return of Horatio Sands from our pilot. Oh, yeah. That he was he was awesome. I I mean he was one of my favorites back when he was on SNL in the earlier days. But I love Horatio Sands in this role. Um, and a lot of the source of a lot of great comedy in that episode as well. Absolutely, in both the pilot and Chapter Twelve. Yeah, and you know just to keep it brief on Chapter Twelve, uh, I thought that you know my score. I'm probably you gave it eight and a half. I'll probably give this one yeah. an eight. Um, maybe okay. not above great, but firmly in the great territory, you know, wouldn't mind watching it more than once, but not sure I would watch it over and over and over again. Like I did the Bo-Katan episode, uh, that took place, uh, before this one. So, um, yeah, I definitely watch it maybe once or twice, uh, which gives it me, means to me, I would give it probably an eight. Uh, and really I thought most of the episode, oh yeah, this is seven, seven territory. But what pushes one into eight territory for me was the incredible ending with yes. Giancarlo Esposito. We get to see Moff Gideon in person. Um, you know, we got a brief cameo in bo episode, but we kind of get a hint as to what his plan is. And it seems like he wants to make his own force-wielding troopers of some sort and create an army of himself to, you know, kind of take back the Empire, I guess, and, you know, reclaim everything that the Empire had before, which... Looks really exciting and left me in very big anticipation for this week's episode. Any final thoughts on Chapter 12, RB? No, I think you're absolutely right. The ending was, was definitely worth the payoff in this episode. But, you know, also some really cool battle sequences in, you know, the episode is titled The Siege, but in the siege of what we think is like a base, but is more a lab. 
Um, and yeah, the ending was definitely worth the payoff. Really enjoyed this episode. Uh, you know, of course, they played off the nostalgia factor. Um, yeah. And I was all for it. I totally liked it. A lot of, like I said, familiar faces from season one. Uh, so really enjoyed this episode. And I didn't realize, I just found this out. Uh, Carl Weathers also directed the episode as well as starring in it, or guest starring, I guess I should say, which is yeah. always impressive. So got to you know, tip the cap to him for sure. Uh, but yeah, this was a good episode. Really enjoyed it, especially for a side mission. Yeah, totally. I think you hit it on the nail there, buddy. And it left me extremely hyped because Mando gets his ship fixed and he says, no, I got somewhere to be. We can't hang out with you guys on Navarro anymore. We got to go. I got to take baby Yoda to his Jedi master. And I was so hyped this whole week. RB, you know, I couldn't stop talking about it when I visited you. And, you know, once I got back home, I kept talking to it uh, about it with my mom and dad. And I've been waiting since 2008 for this episode, RB, when I first saw Ahsoka Tano in the Clone Wars movie back when that came out and then the Clone Wars series. And I got to see her character development grow over those years. And it's over a decade I've been waiting to see live action Ahsoka Tano. And, you know, I think that we should just give our scores right now. I think well, you already yeah, I already gave my score, yeah. Okay, yeah. But we're both going to give this one a 10 out of 10. The Jedi is the best episode of The Mandalorian definitively. I know that I gave Chapter 3, The Heiress, a 10 out of 10 as well. But I think I also mentioned in that episode that... I was really hyped by that episode, and I said, I'm probably going to lower my score later in the season when I can retroactively think back on it, and I am. So I'm going to give the heiress a nine and a half out of ten. Um, you know, it, it, definitely not the best episode of The Mandalorian, but very, very close, very exciting episode. But I think that The Jedi was that much better. It was deserving of the perfect score, 10 out of 10. I can't find a single flaw in this episode. We get answers to so many questions we've had since episode one of The Mandalorian. And Rosario Dawson as Ahsoka Tano kills it in this episode. Oh, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of a spoiler in itself that she's in it, but I don't want to talk plot details right yet. Um, RB, any general thoughts before we go into the spoiler section? Yeah, like you said, 10 out, 10 out of 10 for sure. I agree with you. Definitely the best episode of The Mandalorian uh, thus far. Uh, like I said, if I'm nitpicking, and this is clearly nitpicking, I would say that just when Ahsoka Tano is on screen doing her thing, she's a badass. And so that leaves you know you to feel some of the scenes where she's not and it's more dialogue heavy or... Um, What's the word you always use? Exposition heavy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it seems a little bit slower just because, like I said, you know, there are a lot of scenes of her just kicking ass, which is awesome. Uh, but that said, I think the exposition scenes are still so great compared to, you know, some of the other stuff we've seen so far in this show. So like I said, I'm nitpicking there. Yes, they're slower just because there was so much action in this episode. But that said, I'm still not going to knock it for that. You know, like I said, if you take a step back and look at those exposition scenes versus some of the exposition scenes in some of the other episodes, this is still, uh, without a doubt, the best episode they've put out. Uh, hats off to, of course, John Favreau and then the director of this episode, who I did not realize once again until just now, Dave Filoni, who, uh, you know, notable for his work in uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, of course, your favorite television show, Dom. Praise Dave Filoni, creator of, or not creator, but definitely had some big hands in Avatar Last Airbender and creator of Ahsoka Tano, creator of the Clone Wars. Clone Wars, I see So that, yeah. fitting that he gets to debut her live action uh, appearance. And um, yeah, so, I mean, we've already kind of got into a little spoilers, but if you don't want to know plot details, like what happens with Baby Yoda, specific things that happen in that storyline, pause it now, come back later after you've seen the episode, or if you've already seen it, Keep on going on with us and let's talk our thoughts. So first thing I want to touch on is just the beginning of the episode. Quite possibly the greatest opening to a Mandalorian episode of all time. I had been anticipating this great, mysterious opening and big reveal to Ahsoka Tano, and they subverted my expectations. They give us to her in the first minute of the episode. Mm -hmm. They're like, boom, white lightsabers glowing right straight out of Star Wars Rebels, the ones she uses in Rebels. Boom, white lightsabers, amazing scenes. She's smiling right at the camera. It's amazing. You get to see her face. And oh my gosh, the action scene opening this one where she's going in, in and out of the mist and slashing guys open and guys are terrified of her. 
fantastic. What'd you think of this opening where they just kind of give us to her right away? They didn't build it up. Like I said, we were talking about this. Um, For those of you who follow Dom on social media, you know, we, we got on the phone at about 11, you know, in anticipation for this episode and, you know, just to get some adrenaline out, we're just, you know, getting a good time on Fortnite. (laughs) but you can hear, you know, Dom posted a video on his anticipation for this, but we were saying, you know, at least my prediction was this was going to be like the force awakens where, you know, we spend the whole movie sort of searching for Luke Skywalker. And then at the very end, we see him just turn around and that's the end of the film. That's what I was expecting from this episode that we were just going to get a glimpse of Ahsoka. It was all going to be all about uh, Mando and the child getting to find her and maybe, you know, some, some uh, adversity on the way to finding her. And then at the end we'd see her. Uh, completely blew my mind seeing her right at the beginning was so excited and yeah that that scene was incredible very um, I want to say it was Batman Begins ask the scene at the mm-hmm. docks where you know mm-hmm. he's you know coming in and out of the the shipping totally. containers you know very much you know like that I thought it was an awesome sequence once again I have not watched Rebels so the white lightsabers were badass that's the debut of them for me yeah um, yeah really really cool sequence and just watching her destroy these guys with the you know wielding two lightsabers which once again you know like i said i'm just starting clone wars i'm about 20 episodes in but you know i just see her with the green you know lightsaber seeing her wield too it's really incredible yeah totally and dave filoni you know what you're doing he basically told us you know you guys have been waiting for this let me give it to you right off the bat that's what i loved about this episode so much he didn't say i'm gonna make you wait like you did in force awakens to see luke skywalker he said you guys want Ahsoka, here she is. Let's have a whole Ahsoka episode and this one delivered. So let's go on from there. Mando arrives on the planet and we get to see this kind of village surrounded by a giant wall and there's some people, um, you know, Mando goes inside the village, he takes Baby Yoda, she's, he's trying to find Ahsoka, trying to get some information. And I love the subtext in this scene where, um, you know, he's meeting with the leader of this town. I can't remember the specific name they called her, but, um, she she's yeah he goes in there and on his way there's this giant gate and everything is desolated outside the wall the town itself is desolated and then these gates open and we get to see the leader of this town and she has like this zen japanese style pond and she has these great trees green trees in there and there's this subtext where mando wants to know where ahsoka is she knows but she doesn't know that he knows that he wants ahsoka Right. And so he's kind of like playing against her to get his information. I really enjoyed that subtext. And just outside the gates, I also want to kind of think what you thought about this, Ryan. There's people we get to see kind of the people strung up on the cross version of it in Star Wars. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, we don't really get those people's backstories, but I think they're there more to just show, as you had explained earlier uh, to me, just the pure, uh, you know, sense of good in Ahsoka Tano, because later on we see, you know, when he's trying to bargain to get her to, uh, to train who, uh, you know, the child who we now learn, Gro- Grogar, is that correct? No, I'm you're right? wrong. Oh, Gro- I am? Grogu. Grogu, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, Grogu, um, <laughs> you know, and she says she's not going to do it because she senses fear, of course, alluding to what happened to her master, Anakin Skywalker, but then he's bargaining, um, you know, to get her to train. And, you know, it comes down to him saying, you know, she wants to kill you, talking about the leader. Um, and, you know, let's, you know, let me help you. And basically she goes, are there prisoners there? He said, yeah, there's three strung up right outside the gate. And she, that's when she sort of turns because she is a true fighter for good and wants to free these innocent people. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I thought, it, yeah, I think this is kind of where we had a difference of opinion. I think this is one of the best Star Wars sets ever conceived. Um, You know, of course, episode five, The Empire Strikes Back, Dagobah, the greatest film set of all time. Definitively, no doubt in my mind, I think that is Luke Skywalker landing in his X-Wing into the swamp, meeting Yoda for the first time, and everything that encompasses the Dagobah swamp is pure movie magic. But this episode, I thought, did a great job of kind of going a different direction you know it's still kind of a a foresty area but the forest is decimated and i thought the cinematography in this episode was fantastic what what do you think about the set and then you know kind of go into your thoughts on mando meeting ahsoka right after yeah no the cinematography was wonderful so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna knock that Mm -hmm. i just thought the set was a little simple okay um you know 
I think they were trying to pay homage to Dagobah and, you know, the misty, foresty planet. Um, but of course, give it its own spin. You know, this is post fall of the empire on the outer edge, you know, things are dead, you know, it's basically been taken over by a warlord. I mean, we find out mm -hmm. that the leader of this colony was the one who, you know, whose company built the entire Imperial fleet. Right. Uh, but, you know, I thought the set itself was rather simple. Um, you know, I, I think we've seen some amazing stuff from what they can do with these alien planets on the Outer Rim in Star Wars, whether it's Mandalorian, whether it's Clone Wars, which is, of course, an animated series, whether it's, you know, the original or the prequels or even, you know, the new sequels. They, you know, with CGI, you know, some of the amazing worlds we could bring in. And I was thinking, you know, maybe we'd have a little bit more. I, was, I like to reference the scene where, you know, Grogu and uh ahsoka are communicating to each other and sitting there in the you know the jedi meditation and there's the big moon in the background i'm looking at that and to me that that was clearly you know uh, it looked like a green screen you know with the big moon in the background i think they were trying to with the big full moon make it look almost like a death star in the background that was the only thing i could imagine but you know i felt like like i said the set was simplistic but this episode to me was not about the set or the location it was about ahsoka tano it was about finding out that she is still this force of good um, and that she's still around. So, you know, like, get, like I said, you know, nitpicking here from me. Yeah. But it's not enough to knock it, you know, anything below a 10. Yeah, totally. And I think we should talk about Ahsoka and Baby Yoda convening. We finally get the answers to all the questions we've had. Is Baby Yoda a clone of Yoda? Is he, you know, just another one of his species? Obviously, the latter we get the answer to. And we get some backstory on Grogu, who is not Baby Yoda anymore, even though I still want to call him Baby Yoda all the time. Uh, Grogu was, you know, as Ahsoka explains, you know, they kind of convene by their minds through the Force. And she explains, you know, Grogu's his name. He was alive during the Clone Wars. He trained on Coruscant in the Jedi Temple, just as Ahsoka did, just as Anakin did. And when the fall of the Jedi came, he was snuck out of the temple and put into hiding, um, which I think is a great backstory. How do you feel about the backstory built around Grogu? I, I'm interested to see how it plays out. I'm very frustrated, and I've explained this to you. And this is, you know, of course, a problem you'll get with any film series that makes, you know, doesn't have a solid timeline. You know, things that they're making, things that happened in the past that they've already talked about. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm just curious to see, you know, how Grogu survived Order 66, definitely, because, you know, it's made out both in Return of the Jedi and, um, I'm sorry, in A New Hope and in uh, later Revenge on in of Revenge Sith. of the Sith, that it's uh, that the Jedi were exterminated, that there were none left. So, you know, I'll say it again also, you know, shout out to Dom, he, he purchased me a Jedi Fallen Order, uh, yeah. the video game. It's another one that like that, you know, yes, I love playing the game, don't get me wrong, yeah. but it's another one like, oh, we have another Jedi now. Like, where were these people? you know, between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, because obviously they were alive. So, you know, I'm just here to, I want to, I want to know that. I want to figure out why Ahsoka is all, you know, all upset as well about that there aren't many Jedi left, because by my understanding, this happens after the fall of the Republic, you know, after a return of the Jedi, which to me should mean that there are Jedi, you know, Luke Skywalker should be working with a younger group of, uh, of foundlings and you know training you know young jedi because we see that's what happens in the force awakens so i want to know what the disconnect is there from the end of uh, and that's what this show is for the end of return of the jedi to the force awakens yeah it's bridging um, the gap yeah so i'm excited to see where they go with it right now like i said i'm still really fuzzy which kind of frustrates me um but that's just the kind of guy i am you know can, i want can to go I intervene uh, here yeah go right ahead so i think we should get into our predictions and then you know our final thoughts um I want to say, I think this is where they're going. You know, at the end of the episode, Ahsoka, you know, they rescue the town, obviously. Insane battle sequences, incredible fight choreography, incredible cinematography. Everything like that is pure gold. Mando gets some incredible lines, you know, just cool one-liners, stuff like that, where he's facing off against the guy in the town. But let's get to the ending where Mando almost says goodbye to Baby Yo or to Grogu, and... Ahsoka says, no, I can't train him. Take him to a Jedi temple. Uh, I can't remember the planet. The planet names are terrible for me. I can't remember them. But, you know, go to the Jedi temple, put him at the top peak of the mountain, and he could choose his own path. He could choose his own Jedi mentor. 
And for me, that's saying that this is the direction Mandalorian is going. Bando is going to take Baby Yoda and he's going to call out in the force and Baby Yoda is going to be Luke Skywalker's first student. It's Luke Skywalker, the master, Baby Yoda, the apprentice. And that's what's going to start what we see in The Last Jedi in the flashback with Ben Solo and everything. Because obviously Ben Solo probably isn't born yet. He's, you know, he's only, what, 20 when, by the time of The Force Awakens. So, you know, and there's like 40 years in between Return of the Jedi and uh, The Force Awakens. So, you know, at least 20 years before uh, Han Solo and Leia have Ben Solo. So there's still a lot of time before Luke Skywalker is training Ben Solo. So I think Baby Yoda or Grogu is going to be what starts Luke Skywalker's Jedi Order. Um, so that's my prediction. Do, what do you think? That's an adequate prediction? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, my, my only fear is, and, you know, we can definitely talk about uh, this at a later point, but ba- I, I'm just curious to see where they go with Grogu and his character because Baby Yoda, you know, even before this, before we knew his name, has become such a beloved character. Yeah. Baby Yoda is clearly not in... Uh, the Force Awakens, and therefore in the future, and what they're going to do with that. Because obviously, you know, Yoda lived forever, and maybe Yoda, what, we've decided... 800 years, Grogu. yeah. Yeah, Grogu's only 50 years old, they've decided in the beginning of the series, so maybe 51 now. So mm-hmm. what what happened? Where is he? Once again, like I said, this is my one complaint about Star Wars not going with the fluid timeline, making things episode one to mm-hmm. episode nine. You know, they go back and place things in, and, you know, you have to piece it together. And sometimes yeah. that leads to things not making sense, which... totally. You know, I'm just curious to see how they go with it. But like I said, I'm intrigued. I'm excited to see where they go with it. I'm totally bought into the story. It's not like I'm going to stop watching because I'm like, it didn't happen because, you know, hats off to, uh, you know, Lucas, Lucas Films and everyone who's had a hand in Star Wars over these, what, almost 50 years now? Yeah. Uh, you know, because they do that. It's so groundbreaking. You don't see, at least at that time, many movies to do that, to make a solid three films. And then instead of, moving forward and continuing the story, jumping back, doing prequels. And then not only that, but then making sequels that don't come after the prequels, but after the original three films. And then making movies that bridge the gaps in between those films and TV shows. So hats off to everyone on that team. Like I said, I'm totally intrigued. I want to see where they go with it. Like I said, right now I'm a little frustrated, just trying to piece everything together in my head. But like I said, I still really enjoy it. And I, I do want to say, RB, I think maybe if you watch the rest of Clone Wars, Which and I if you get on, into yeah. Rebels, yeah, totally. I think that you might get a little bit better of an understanding of the timeline. But then again, I could totally see where you're going because even I, you know, a scholar of those shows, am still a little fuzzy on what happens between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. That's uncharted territory. I'm excited to see where they go. So, you know, with that said, I think there was another big drop. I do want to bring it out. Um, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Ahsoka is on the hunt for Grand Admiral Thrawn. Uh, RB, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, season three and four, he's the main villain of Rebels, and he is one of the most menacing villains in Star Wars history. He's a big blue guy with red eyes, and he is fantastic in the show. He is voiced by, um, you know, do you know of the actor Mads Mikkelsen? Yeah, man, he was just tagged to be uh, to replace Johnny Depp as uh, as Grindelwald in the Fantastic Beast series. Absolutely, yeah. So not him, but his brother is the voice of Grand Admiral Thrawn. But they have okay. very similar voices, so you can kind of imagine that kind of performance coming through in the animated show. Yeah. So if they're going to go through with this Ahsoka storyline, I have a strong feeling that this was it for Ahsoka this season, and season three is where we're going to pick up uh, where we left off in this episode with Ahsoka. And, um, you know, let me just spout out a few more predictions. I think at the end of this season, he's going to hand off Baby Yoda to Luke Skywalker, and that's going to be it for Grogu. And then I think the Mandalorian, you know, him being the Mandalorian and the title of the show, it's going to be about him retaking his home world with Bo-Katan and the help of Ahsoka and him finding the way. Like we've always been saying, what's his way? You know, he's been indoctrinated in this cult of Mandalorians. But what's the way for him? Is it to continue in that tribalistic style? Or is it for him to finally give in and remove his helmet and become the kind of Mandalorian that Bo-Katan is and try to retake Mandalore and have a gigantic battle versus Moff Gideon, which is what I hope to see. So um, that could be amazing too. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the show, RB. Um, What else do you have to say for this? 
Yeah, you know, I, I agree with a lot of those points. I think I'm going to deviate just a little bit from, from your theory, and maybe this is just wistful thinking on my, on my point of view, but I would love to see, you know, maybe this is the end of Ahsoka until, you know, like we saw in The Mandalorian season one, you know, that big, like, two-part season finale, where I okay. think Ahsoka, you know, it's going to be, you know, bo Katan's going to come back. Um, it's going to be a big standoff. My guess would be with Moff Gideon. I'm hoping maybe they get uh, Boba Fett involved as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we're going to have basically Moff Gideon working with Boba Fett as his, you know, sort of number two, his heavy, whatever yeah. you want to call him. Yeah, totally. Facing off with the Mandalorian. And Ahsoka is going to show up and Bo-Katan is going to show up. And there's just going to be a great standoff sequence. Like we saw in season one, the standoff with Moff Gideon and the... Uh, and uh, the stormtroopers uh, against, you know, Carl Weathers character and, you know, the people we had in, in chapter 12 back in season one. And even, yeah. even, you know, the, the bounty hunter droid. Who IG-11. Played a role. Yes. Yeah, totally, man. Um, I could totally see that happening too. And as far as the news I've been reading, you know, Giancarlo Esposito has been saying on, you know, Twitter and on, in interviews and stuff that, from now on, you know, from this episode on, he said it's pure action. He says so much battles are going to happen in the rest of season two, which makes me exponentially excited for the continuation of this series. And um, I'm curious to see what Jedi is going to come and find Baby Yoda. Is it going to be Luke Skywalker? Is it going to be Ezra Bridger from uh, Star Wars Rebels, who we see is also a Jedi during this time, and he kind of disappears at the end of Rebels? Um, we'll see. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Maybe it's someone entirely new. We'll get to see a completely new Jedi uh, come and, 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 and help Baby Yoda in his way of the Jedi. Um, oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention before we wrap up. I know we're going too long on this one, but it's such a fantastic episode. We got to talk it through. What did you think about the Anakin Skywalker reference, RB? Um, I'm, did you pick that up or did you, did it kinda, did you miss it? Are we, are we discussing where... Um where Ahsoka Tano refuses to train Grogu because she says, you know, I sense too much, much fear in him. And we've seen what, what fear can do to even the strongest of our Jedi. Yeah. Uh, even and... the strongest of Jedi master. Yeah. I, I caught onto that immediately. I think, um, you know, once again, this was something that I wouldn't have caught onto if I hadn't started watching the Clone Wars, but seeing the relationship between Ahsoka Tano and Anakin Skywalker immediately picked up on the reference. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's uh you know, it's, all, it's always a running point in Star Wars, whether it was Yoda at first refusing to train Luke on Dagobah, whether it's, um, you know, when Qui-Gon brings uh, a young Anakin Skywalker to the Jedi uh, Council and Coruscant in uh, The Phantom Menace, or now with Grogu. Um, even even uh, Luke Skywalker uh, refusing to train at first uh, Rey. Rey, uh, Rey, yeah. yeah. So, totally. I mean, I yeah. think this is definitely a running theme in Star Wars, and you know, what Jedi makes the right decision? Because clearly, no matter what sequence of Star Wars we're in or series of Star Wars we're in, somebody seems to make a wrong decision and a wrong turn, and one of the strongest, strongest uh, protagonists becomes one of the major antagonists. Totally, totally. And yeah, I think you hit it right on there, dude. Like, that is a theme in Star Wars, and that's what's happening right now. And I love that they're continuing the themes that's the best thing about the Mandalorian. It still feels like Star Wars, you know, so much. And that's what I love about it. But it's also so new that it, it, it can balance both, I think. And that's what this episode did a great uh, job of balancing the old and the new and, you know, the stuff from the animated shows and bringing it all together and combining it in a way that we've been begging them to do. So chapter 13, clearly the greatest episode of Mandalorian and me and RB's book. Um, yeah, 10 out of 10, guys couldn't recommend it more and we hope you guys thought the same let us know down in the comments what you thought of chapter 13 the jedi uh your thoughts and everything down below there and also if you like this video and our commentary give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to see the rest of our mandalorian season two video reviews we'll be dropping those friday um you know a little intermission last week but from now on we'll drop them every friday and like rb said looking forward to getting the new set up in our new apartment and Hopefully we'll have a little bit higher video quality production since we won't be doing this over Zoom. We'll be doing this locally on my laptop and camera that I always record on here. 
So, you know, a little bit higher quality videos, plus, uh, you know, a little bit faster uploads because we'll have better internet than I do here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that'll looking, looking forward to a lot of great things happening in the next few weeks. And Mandalorian is just getting us hyped up even more. And RB, looking forward to moving in with you, buddy. Uh, Want to give us, uh, give the fans our social media handles and take us out? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Top of the List. Uh, my name is Ryan Barnett, or RB. You can find me on Instagram at RB underscore the underscore SID, or on Twitter at RB with the call. To my left or right, not really sure, my co-host Dom Gonzalez. You can find him on Instagram at Twitter at Dom Gonzalez 48, D-O-M-G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-S 48 on both Instagram and Twitter. Be sure to reach out if you have any questions for us about the show. Any suggestions, or of course, like Dom said, you know, leave us a comment, leave us a review, like, follow, subscribe. Um, but thanks for watching. Have a great week, guys. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving.